Greetings. Um, as, uh, as Father said, I'm uh, Dr. James Mwabali. I'm a doctor of acupuncture and Chinese medicine. I'm an Orthodox Christian, and part of the reason why um, uh, I guess Kent invited me to speak and part of what I hope to offer you is uh, some classical perspectives on um, how medicine was practiced in the ancient world and how we can bring that kind of into the modern world, um, particularly around end-of-life issues. Uh, my personal focus is obviously in Chinese medicine, um, which is unique perhaps in the world because Chinese medicine has an unbroken history of about 2,000 plus years where scholars have been dialoguing, physicians have been practicing. So it has a very rich intellectual history, uh, spiritual history, and practical history as well. Um, my background before Chinese medicine was at um, was in philosophy from St. John's College. I went to the one in Santa Fe. Um, so uh, it's really through philosophy, through um, a critical analysis of Western thought, that I started to discover the shortcomings of Western thought. You know, the same Western thought that John was talking about that kind of led us into the current situation with our burial practices. Um, and through that, I, I knew that I was drawn into um, the healing arts and into, towards medicine in general, so I found Chinese medicine. And it was actually through Chinese medicine that God actually led us into orthodoxy. We were not orthodox before then, so it's an interesting, interesting tale I hope to tell you all sometime, but um, if we could go to the next slide. Um, at St. John's and in my training, we uh, were all about the questions. Um, it's through these questions that we develop a deep relationship to the content that we have in front of us. Um, rather than looking for simple answers, we're trying to find why we believe what we believe. And it's through this process of questioning that we can kind of figure that out. Um, it also, uh, the great thing about using questions to guide our examination of these more challenging subjects is that it leads us to understanding how things are connected to other things and we develop a network of information rather than isolated truths you know for example we believe in the resurrected body it's a wonderful dogma but how do we how does that connect to our funeral practice how does that connect to um, uh, everything else in our modern life so the questions here are um, uh, I think that these questions are going to be important to anybody that's considering this topic. We have a leg up as Orthodox Christians. We have the fathers that provide us wonderful answers to many of these questions. Um, but the issue is that um, without answering these questions, we end up in a situation much like um, modern, uh, the modern hospital system is in where we don't have answers to these questions, so as a result, anything is permissible. You know, assisted suicide is permissible. Um, you know, we have uh, dramatic, heroic interventions at the end of life are permissible, all, of be all because we don't have a root uh, foundation in understanding these questions. Um, so the first question, which is the most important, is why are people alive? Um, why do people die? How is death different than life? And this is something that John was talking a lot about. How, what are the needs of the dead? What do they really need from us? What's our part in the greater scheme of things? And how do these needs differ from the needs of the living? Um, and in the context of hospice in particular, we think about what is the most important thing for a dying person to do? Um, a lot of rhetoric now in the hospice establishment centers around uh, smoothing the transition, which I think is perhaps a little foreign to orthodoxy, um, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, you know, there's a big emphasis on repentance in the Church Fathers as being the primary thing that that is uh, the goal of hospice care. Um, but Importantly, at the end of all of this, we have to ask ourselves, not only what do we believe in, like John was saying about the, the reality of the soul, but similarly, do our funeral rituals reflect what we believe in? Do our funeral rituals really showcase and uh, make an example of what we believe? And similarly, does our medicine actually reflect what we believe? Um, my goal, again, with Chinese medicine in this context is that you can glimpse a unified and harmonious system 
I don't expect that everybody here will flock to the doctor of Chinese medicine for their hospice care, but I do hope that at the very least you'll understand how you could make medical decisions in a way that is um, more in line with a philosophical system rather than trying to reinvent the wheel and make all of these decisions by yourself. Um, there are also some practical takeaways for the treatment of the, the living survivors and for the dead. Um, even if you don't know Chinese medicine, even if you don't um, you know, subscribe to the entire system, there are very simple things we can do that, um, that you know, I've tailored this talk specifically to add relevance and add, add a depth of meaning to the orthodox, medical, or the orthodox um, funeral practices. Um, so, yeah, um, now you can go to the next slide. So on the question of why are people alive, um, it might seem a little out of place in a discussion of funeral practices, but it really is the fundamental question of any medical system. The reason being that medicine, in order to function properly, needs to have a definition of what health is. Um, and because it's trying to return people to a healthy life, um, we have to use our medicine in a way that we're actually working towards that goal. Um, so you need to have really a philosophical foundation of what it means to be healthy. Uh, Chinese medicine is a very varied medicine. Like I said, it's got a very long tradition. So we have many definitions. Um, there's the definition, there's the philosophy of yin and yang, where we understand that there's heaven above, yang, there's uh, earth below, yin, and that man is smack dab in the middle, and he's mediating between these two forces. So we're responsible for you know, uh, tilling the soil so that the crops can grow up to heaven, and then we cut them down and they feed our bodies and it goes back to the soil. Um, as compost. So that is a fundamental philosophy um, of Chinese medicine. Similarly in the five elements, which is this, um, you know, it's the transition from uh, spring to summer to late summer, fall and winter. Um, it's a system of correspondences where we see, um, you know, the, the five elements, wood, fire, earth, metal, water, manifesting in the world. But in between that seasonal transition, we see also the interaction between water and fire, between fire and metal. So water puts out fire, fire melts metal, metal cuts down wood. So inherent in that philosophy is the idea that life is about conflict and that the fallen world is in particular about conflict. And this conflict really defines who we are and uh, death is really a cessation of that conflict. Um, early Chinese medicine, if you go um, particularly into the BCs, um, you'll find that it's very, very similar to what John was describing in Africa, where there's a lot of um, practices focused on the ancestors. Um, it, was, it was the way that people reached towards eternity in the time before Christ. Um, so the living care for the dead and the dead care for the living. And it's this mutual relationship of balance that really creates a healthy society and a healthy world. Um, but in contrast, uh, Western medicine doesn't really provide much of an answer, which is part of the issue that we face. Um, some people might argue that a Darwinian perspective is the foundation of Western medicine, in which, the, um, in which case, um, we would say that the reason we exist, the reason why life exists, is simply chance. Um, or another perspective is that we're all just born to have sex. So that's, um, that's really the conclusion of Western medicine. And unfortunately, um, you know, it doesn't offer a whole lot as to our interventions. Um, the issue, however, is that uh, Western medicine as it's practiced is not rooted in the Darwinian foundations. If it were, then the philosophical system would collapse, the interventions would collapse with it. In fact, the problem is that we're operating not from a Darwinian perspective because we're preserving individuals that are no longer capable of reproducing. And that's, that's where this disconnect happens, where we're acting in one way and saying that we believe another thing. Um, so to a counterpoint to the Darwinian perspective, I offer Schrodinger. Um, Schrodinger was a quantum physicist who examined life 
and was really seminal to uh, geneticists ultimately discovering the genetic code and, um, and DNA. And he made an evaluation based on thermodynamics, which was his specialty, you know, uh, where heat moves and how hot bodies, um, you know, warm up cold bodies and so on. Um, and his conclusion based on thermodynamics is that life is fundamentally an anti-entropy machine. So entropy is, um, in quantum, uh, in thermodynamics, it's this, the tendency of a system to move towards disorder, um, where everything starts all together and then over time, over thousands of years perhaps, over an hour if it's a teapot, um, your teapot will cool, all that heat that you put into it will dissipate into the environment, never to be seen again. Um, so that's, that's the conclusion based on thermodynamics. Um, but the interesting thing about this is that it emphasizes, um, it emphasizes order as essentially the meaning of life. That if we can continue to create order in the world, then we, we do have a fundamental meaning. Um, so I would say that going forward, um, one, of, one of the things that Western medicine would need to do in order to become more philosophically sound would be to re-examine its, um, its principles and to look at, um, say, Schrodinger as an example. Um, because it actually, as I was mentioning before, it is the foundation of, um, of our understanding of genetics, um, what he said. But, uh, we can go to the next slide. And so the question, uh, why do people die, is obviously what we're all here for. Most traditions uh, tend to agree that uh, it's the soul leaving the body. Very few thinkers, if you look at the history of Western thought, if you look at the history of Eastern thought, very few thinkers <coughs> posit that there is no soul. It's really not a question for most of human history. Um, even Descartes actually believed that there was a soul and that it had a really specific location, and that location was the pineal gland. So, um, so it, was, um, it wasn't something that we really doubted until recently. Um, so the issue, though, is that without a soul and without, without the philosophy of why people are alive, Western medicine, again, continues to lack a philosophy of death. In Chinese medicine, um, there are, again, many answers. I'll just talk about two briefly. Um, the first answer is that the interpenetration of yin and yang, that, um, again, that chaos <coughs> merging into order, um, is the, uh, that's life happening. And when, re uh, when heaven returns to heaven and earth returns to earth, that's the separation of yin and yang. That's sort of the return to chaos. Um, one, of, one of the interesting things about that is that, again, Chinese medicine is, again, based on thermo thermodynamics. So uh, it's a bit of a difference where in quantum mechanics we say that um, order is lost into chaos, but then in Chinese medicine and in Chinese thought, we have the fundamental assumption that out of chaos always reemerges order. Um, so the other um, system of thinking about death in Chinese medicine is um, actually the three worms, um, which we will get into a lot later, and um, the divergent channels, kind of a loss of latency. The basic idea there is that, um, say with cancer, People store things away in their bodies. They store them away in safe places. They're trying to keep them in hiding until finally <coughs> you get weak enough, until finally you know, something happens in your life, maybe a major stressor, and then uh, all that stuff that we were successfully keeping in hiding, it's, we're no longer successful anymore. And um, ultimately, it overtakes our defenses one by one, and um, the things that we were kind of hiding uh, become the seed of our death. Um, and we can go to the next slide. So the fundamental question that I hope to answer or ask with you all is uh, what medical approach uh, interventions are appropriate in end-of-life care? Um, 
medicine, uh, this is something my teacher says, that medicine is philosophy and practice. If you believe that the soul and the body work together, then whenever you treat the body, you're treating the soul, and whenever you treat the soul, you're treating the body. So as a result, what we believe about the soul has a profound impact on the way that we interact with the body. Um, so medicine and religion are as inseparable as the soul is from the living body. Um, and this is something that I feel like John was starting to get at. Um, our modern practices around medicine and around death and around funeral practices are not random freak occurrences. They're not, you know, people kind of stepwise making, um, making folly after folly until we end up with like um, all of these practices. Ultimately, they are the fruit of a belief system about death. They're the fruit of a new religion. Um, and, you know, we, it's a religion that I think we as Orthodox Christians are trying to get out of um, because it's something that is taking us away from what we believe. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so this is moving into the actual care of the dying individual. There are two basic steps. Um, first, you have to establish that somebody's really dying. Um, even in Chinese medicine, that means that we have to continually attempt revival with whatever tools we have at our disposal. Um, herbs, you know, needles, massage, um, whatever we have available, we try to use. And, um, you know, it's, uh, there are some reasons for that aside from the direct, um, the direct revival of the individual. Um, part of, um, part of what you notice in Chinese culture and in Chinese medicine is that, uh, again, the practices emphasize the, again, the reality of the belief system. So there they believe that part of the soul, the hun, goes up towards heaven. Um, so when they are trying to resuscitate somebody, they go up on their rooftop and they try to call the hun back down. And this is an ancient practice. Obviously, you're not going to see this in China today, but... Um, but yeah, so I mean, if you believe that somebody's soul is going up towards heaven, then you had better get as high as you can to call them back down if you really, you know, are acting in a way that is commensurate with your belief system. Um, so the reason why we're doing this, um, obviously, we want our loved ones to be with us. It's, it's a tragedy when we lose them. But uh, from a medical perspective and perhaps a spiritual perspective, um, we want them to have enough time to finish everything that they needed to do in this life. Um, in Orthodox Christian terms, we hear about this as um, people having time to repent. Um, there's one of my favorite stories is St. Sisyphus, who was the abbot of a monastery, um, you know, did many, worked many miracles. He was an incredible figure. Everybody loved him. By the time he was dying, everyone knew that he was going to be a saint. Nevertheless, um, his disciples asked him, Abba Sisuis, um, is there anything that you wish for? Anything that you, know, you wish for before you die? And he said, I wish I had more time to repent. Um, it's, really, it's really a never-ending process, even for, even for the saints. And um, of course, shortly thereafter, he reposed. And um, actually what happened was that a flash of light emanated from his body and filled the room. Um, and he was incorrupt. Uh, in Chinese thought, um, the way that they think about it is in terms of uh, the hun, it's a bit of like the record of your life. It's kind of the autobiography. So as the hun is leaving the body, we have this opportunity to review all of the things that we've done, which you often see in you know, modern media depictions. People are dying. They see their life flashing before their eyes. And... The Chinese perspective is that if you at any point say, no, I'd like to do that again, I'd like to redo that, then that becomes the seed of your next incarnation. If you're coming at it from a Chinese Buddhist perspective, it's the reincarnation, obviously. Um, but if you're coming at it from a Chinese uh, folk medicine perspective, that part of you, that unfinished business, really lingers around and it becomes a ghost. It becomes something that 
other people have to deal with because you left this thing behind that wasn't quite finished. So I think that's very compatible with the orthodox goal of, again, repentance of saying that, you know, we don't want to have any regrets. We don't want to die knowing that we could have done something different. That's why we confess before we die. Um, so that's, um, yeah. There are obviously fewer ethical issues in Chinese medicine because it's much less invasive. Um, the main difference that we're all aware of is that in uh, Western medicine, you have to draw the line with your revival attempts, and that is a tough decision to make. Um, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So how do we know when to draw the line? How do we know when to give up? Um, modern technology has, by all accounts, bypassed the parameters of normal human life. We can make people live beyond when their body was supposed to. Um, using the example of uh, feeding tubes, um, you know, there's the channels of Chinese medicine, you know, say the lung channel, which begins in the lungs and goes out to the thumb, and then the large intestine comes back into the nose and goes to the large intestine. And the channels are an integral part of the functioning of the organs in our theory. Um, the word for channel is jing, which is actually the same word for scripture. So in uh, Chinese, um, they call the channels jing, but then the Bible is called the god jing, the god scripture. Um, you know, the Buddhist texts are called like the Lotus Jing, you know, so it's anything that's a holy document that conveys deep knowledge and is timeless is considered to be a Jing. Um, so when we're talking about feeding tubes, uh, when we ask ourselves uh, about whether that's accomplishing the function of the stomach, whether that's accomplishing the Jing of the stomach, the strict scripture of the stomach, like our stomach was really designed so that we could take in food through our mouth, that we could um, dine with our families, that we could process information. Because in Chinese medicine, um, when we look at the stomach, we don't just look at the physical, we look at the mental and the spiritual components. So just as we digest food, similarly, our stomach um, channel goes to our eyes, and it helps us digest information that we take in in the world. So with a feeding tube, where you're no longer tasting what it is, it's no longer food, it's all protein powders and you know, artificial substances. Uh, are we really accomplishing the scripture of what God made the stomach for? Um, you know, it's, it's really, that's where I personally would draw the line, uh, where I thought that I was no longer doing, um, you know, I was no longer able to accomplish what it meant to be human. Similarly, similarly with ventilators, what does it feel like to take a breath when we go up to the top of a mountain and we take in this breath of fresh, thin air um, and we feel it in our lungs and it's bracing and it's invigorating? Um, is it possible to have that experience with a ventilator? You know, what are we experiencing when we are on a ventilator? Is that the same as, you know, breathing in uh, the smell of incense, for example, um, or is that really fundamentally a different process that's no longer doing what the breath is supposed to do in the body? Fundamentally, it comes down to different definitions of biological processes where from a biochemical perspective, yeah, you've got oxygen, you've got glucose, you've got everything you need, um, but it's not really complete from an experiential perspective where, you know, imagine if you had to live your life eating only protein powder, you know, and uh, insure drinks, like, that wouldn't be a very happy life now, and it certainly wouldn't be a very happy life at the end. Um, so, again, we return to the question of what is the meaning of being human, and at what point are we not able to accomplish this meaning? Um, the reason I talk about the scripture of the stomach is because it really emphasizes the fact that the theological is manifest inside of the everyday, that, again, God gave us a stomach and so that it could do specific things, and that when we work outside of those parameters, we're doing disservice to a scripture, in a way. Um, we can go to the next slide. 
Um, the other issue um, that kind of comes up is the there's a variety of things around heroic and expensive procedures. As Father John Baer was talking about, the end-of-life expenditure tends to be enormous for your average American. Um, so in, um, in our funeral practices, you know, we're always thinking, should I have the $30,000 Cadillac coffin or should I have you know, a pine coffin, for example, and I think as Orthodox Christians, we're more and more erring in the direction of simplicity. Um, and I think that, you know, some people argue, well, we can give that money to the poor, we can use that for other means. So that's certainly something that comes up with these expensive procedures. Um, the other issues that come up are, again, about the body, uh, where, you know, if, say, um, my neighbor, uh, not, he, didn't, he wasn't orthodox, he uh, fell and shortly afterwards they didn't really know what was wrong and then they found out that he had a brain bleed and he was in his late 80s, I think, um, and he was cognitively not all the way there. Um, and so they found out he had a brain bleed and then they did uh, emergency brain surgery on him and he didn't make it. So rather than letting this person die peacefully, um, what happened was that they cracked his skull open. You know, they cut his skull open with a saw, and um, that's, that's how his body ended up being. So in the same way that we think about embalming, for example, as being <coughs> abominable and not really part of the Orthodox faith, I would say that we should feel similarly about end-of-life surgeries. Um, nothing to say about... Um, you know, perhaps it would give you pause about during life surgeries, but that's a very different, very different discussion. But certainly when the body is either incapable of healing or doesn't have the time to heal, um, you know, these issues come up. Um, and then, of course, the last uh, main issue there is uh, the circumstances of death. Uh, you know, as, as I was saying with my neighbor, uh, he died under anesthesia in a hospital surgical uh, operating room. And so he did not have the time to repent. He did not have the time to process all of those things that we as Christians find to be so important. Um, so I, uh, the question is, would you rather die under anesthesia or would you rather slowly <laughs> lose consciousness as a result of the brain bleed? in the first place. Um, another issue that comes up uh, in modern medicine is the way that it's structured, particularly with insurance, is that there are a lot of flowcharts that practitioners have to work around and good practitioners will work around the flowcharts and do what's right for their patients. However, it's always an uphill battle where you know, the insurance company is telling you to do this and you have to like navigate around that to do what's in your patient's best interest. Um, it's a similar thing with hospice where very often what happens in hospice is that there are certain protocols that once you enter into hospice, they put you on certain medications, they put you on, um, you know, at least in my experience, I can't speak to hospices in general, um, but there are certain protocols that um, patients or physicians would have to specifically opt out of if they were um, if they were trying to do things a little bit differently. Um, so that's just something to be cognizant of. Uh, it's not necessarily a problem in and of itself, but it's just something to be aware of as you interact with these establishments. The other thing is that as modern people, um, you know, John's always making the new world, old world distinction. Um, we as New Worlders tend to believe in specialists. We want the best oncologist. We want the guy who's studied in the best place. And then after that, we want the best hospice doctor, somebody who worked exclusively with the dying. And then again, funeral director. Um, so it's really a natural trans, uh, translation of specialization where we start with our highly specialized medicine and we move through the motions. Um,